I was reminded of a, I don't know if you would call it a, f a form, but a, um, a lovely um, a sort of small ceremony that we ended up spontaneously making uh, a form in Switzerland. And that is that each morning early, uh, I would stand just inside the doorway of the Zendo and as each person stepped across the threshold, we would bow to each other as we, as every person came in. And I noticed uh, today, um, several of you, as you came in, I could see Catherine and Claudine, and on, as you came in, people would bow as they entered. And I, it's kind of a nice um, ritual uh, to do. Uh, if I responded, I'd be bowing constantly as you came online. <laughs> But uh, I, just, I, I also wanted you to know that I noticed and felt your presence in that welcome. <clears throat> so let's uh, begin our sitting.
just these few minutes, these brief minutes of our sitting together, we're practicing over and over, bringing ourselves to the present moment as best we can with our body by sitting upright with some attention and some dignity, nothing unusual or particularly formal, but intentional. And we practice that embodied expression of our awakened nature. Even while we might feel anything but awake or free inside, but we are practicing non-reactivity. Sitting in and as that spacious heart and mind, which is the container for all the thoughts and feelings, but without clinging to or abiding in or responding to all the thoughts and feelings. Our mind won't stop. Our body remains alive and responsive. But we become more and more able to realize and express our natural state. Even while all the other goes on. And this is truly a wonder that this is possible. And that it makes such a difference in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So while it may seem like we're doing nothing, we're enacting and practicing something essential and necessary. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. We also uh, remember <clears throat> that as we as we invoke this um, the verse of the robe, excuse me, <clears throat> following our sitting, we're echoing and underscoring uh, that ability to uh, to sit, to uh, touch deeply and fully our natural state which is the space in which all the other parts of our conditioning arise and pass away. <clears throat> That's the vast liberation in which we actually abide. We just completed a, an intensive, um, an integrated retreat 
sponsored by the Open Doors Zen community in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, some of you were uh, participants in that retreat. And as I often do after a weekend of retreat, the following uh, inquiry, I like to just carry the teachings forward a little bit uh, for those who were in the retreat and, and also make them um, a little taste for all of you who were not. It continues to weave us together. The um, theme or title which was chosen by Open Door for that, for the retreat was Wonder, with an O, Wonder, in the face of uncertainty. Wonder in the face of uncertainty. Uh, alluding to where we find ourselves at this moment. In fact, I'll read four or five sentences that were used as a description for that retreat. So that will give you an encapsulated um, version. And the questions that were the practice edges that were brought forward in the retreat. So here, here's the small description. We never really know what is coming. We're constantly walking through the vulnerable territory of impermanence and uncertainty, whether we're awake to it or not. But this past year has brought it all so much closer than ever before. Even though we don't know what is next, we're nevertheless challenged to remain upright, attentive, alert, and responsive. What does the Dharma teach in terms of our human capacity for responding to suffering in its many forms, even as we embrace the uncertainties of life? How do we maintain wonder and imagination without closing down? How do we continue to work for the benefit of others when we feel our own life is challenged? I, I read the description um, partly to, to bring us together around the theme, but also because I think these, these several sentences are um, a lovely way to speak about where we find ourselves and the practice edges that our current situation is bringing us to. And this is what we inquire into deeply as we, um, as we touch our own practice uh, with, with some intimacy and some, some vitality. As I reflected on these descriptions and questions about not knowing what's really coming, always walking through the vulnerable territory of impermanence, um, our call to remain upright and attentive and alert and responsive in the midst of it all, and wondering what the Dharma could teach us to help us navigate this territory. I was rereading um, a few things as I do in preparation, and I, I touched on an introduction to a small volume that some of you have, I know, called The Essential Dogen. It's, it's a small compendium of aspects of Dogen Zenji's writings, the 13th century Japanese monk who lineage in which we were, were part of. And th these translations by uh, Kaz Tanahashi and Peter Levitt are, are quite wonderful if you're in, inclined to read uh, and study Dogen, which can be a little challenging. And in uh, Peter's introduction, and in Peter Levitt um, is, a, is a wonderful man and a dear friend of, of ours. Um, he starts his introduction with, with this. He says, in 1954, the poet Allen Ginsberg wrote a poem called Song that acknowledges the weight of our human circumstance and suffering in a particular and somewhat unusual way. So I was caught by that first sentence, that there was a poem that Ginsberg wrote, you know, nearly 70 years ago, acknowledging the weight of our human circumstance and suffering. Well, this was part of our theme. 
Here's how the, the poem begins. Just the first tiny bit. We're not going to look at the whole poem. Under the burden of solitude, under the burden of dissatisfaction, the weight, the weight we carry is love. I'll read that small section again. Under the burden of solitude, think of this past year, under the burden of dissatisfaction, a year of lockdown, the weight, the weight we carry is love. And as we find ourselves suffering or struggling or carrying this kind of weight, it's often accompanied by a longing, which we're all feeling pretty strongly right now. So his poem expresses the longing to return to uh, what our practice actually guides us toward, is that human possibility that has many descriptors in various wisdom traditions, uh, wholeness, oneness, unity, true self, the natural state, this return to something essential. And what Ginsberg calls it is, is love. And we're all feeling some aspect of this kind of longing. Now, I would imagine that it's part of the longing that might bring you to inquiry, actually. Ginsberg was pretty young when he wrote the poem, but apparently he experienced what many of us feel is a sort of intuitive uh, something calling this deeply inside, intuitive uh, certainty that, uh, that these twin burdens that he speaks about in the beginning of solitude and dissatisfaction, which is so present for us now, would be relieved if the if this realization of wholeness, this return of love could find its expression in the world. That if we could return to love, return to love, and its realization and an expression, just like I was speaking about in our meditation, the realization of what's true in the expression, the enactment, that the twin burdens of solitude and dissatisfaction might be relieved in some way. Um, and, and Peter Levitt uh, wrote, he said, of course, Ginsburg also understood, like, like we do, that his longing for completion was not his alone. There was that personal longing he felt, the personal longing that you feel, but part of the common spiritual yearning experienced by people in every place and time. And so he acknowledges this in the final lines of the poem through the repetition of a single affirmative word, you'll hear that, followed by other rhythmic phrasing that functions like the beating of a heart. And so this is the very end of the poem. What we read earlier was the very beginning. Yes. Yes. That's what I wanted. I always wanted, I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. Yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted, I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. And to return to the body of wholeness. That's what we chant in the beginning the one true nature, the body of unity, what Dogen in his other writings called the body after the final body, and what Ginsburg is talking about as the body of love. And it's this kind of body of love that he longed for. And whatever, you know, descriptors or words we use to point to this um, primordial or essential or foundational, whatever, condition of oneness is acknowledged in every 
spiritual tradition. And, and Ginsberg is, uh, refers to the journey as a return. And this is what we call taking refuge, to fly home, to come back. And one way to think about this return to wholeness, I think, our shared journey at this moment, as we attempt to return to s something, you know, I'm I a little... I have a little funny feeling when I hear people speak, especially in the media or, or wherever, about return to normal or get back to normal, which I don't think that that actually describes what's possible. There will be a return to fullness and wholeness and connectedness and love as we move forward into not knowing what it will be. But one of the turns that happens through practice, is that our personal longing, the one that we might hold, it's just simply our own longing, evolves, it doesn't leave, but it evolves further into what we call bodhicitta, the aspiration that all beings return to their original body of awakening, that all people realize that they're perfection, their wholeness has never been dimmed. And we may not be able to feel this or see this under the weight of our circumstance, but that's, that's what we practice to relieve. And this is the alchemy of practice, which transforms personal longings into the heart and mind of a bodhisattva. And this is truly a wonder, especially in the face of uncertainty. under the burden of solitude, under the burden of dissatisfaction, the weight, the weight we carry is love. What is this weight? And then yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted. I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. How do we make that turn, return? In the beginning of the description of the retreat, I said, we never really know what's coming. But that's always true. That, that's just the nature of reality. And our practice calls us to remain awake in the midst of that. And our life is sort of like a, a koan, you know, those unusual stories that we meet from our Zen ancestors that we try to, we think of trying to solve, but our life is a koan, this unfolding story in which we're all embedded and we're all really busy trying to solve the koan of our life, which is not solvable. Instead, we live our way into it and follow where it points us. And once again, the next sentence in the description, we're constantly walking through this vulnerable territory. And we're asked to remain upright. You know, the um, impact and the immediacy of the pandemic and, and all that's gone with it, I say the pandemic because that's the larger bit. There's also the social unrest, the racial violence, the gun, you know, all of this, the political things. But let's say in the pandemic, we've seen both the horror and also the beauty of what it's revealed, not the beauty of the deaths and the difficulty. But this, this whole larger capacity is the entrance, it's the Dharma gate of wonder, is when we can remain in our body and stay with the immediacy, embodied immediacy. Because anything that dulls this, our embodied immediacy, will turn us away from wonder. And anything which supports and encourages embodied immediacy, like zazen, will brighten the creative light of wonder and creativity. And this is the foundation of our forms. The way that we transmit Zen practice is mindful embodiment and mutual care. We ask people to do things in certain ways. 
And what does the Dharma teach us? About responding to suffering as we embrace uncertainties? Well, this is all the Dharma ever teaches. This is the whole, whole practice. How to meet suffering without closing down, without centering on the self, without making things worse for ourselves and for others. And saying yes, just like in the poem, yes to life means choosing your life over and over again. The yes and the yes, that's what I wanted. Outside of our personal preferences and our conditional habits and reactivity, when we say liberation and light freedom, what we're liberated from, what we're free from is, is reactivity from our reactive patterns. That's what we get free of. That's nirvana. That's the cessation of reactivity. While the unconscious and habitual playing out of our reactivity is samsara. That's everyday suffering. And how do we maintain wonder and imagination without closing down? Well, this is the entire function of practice. In, in a retreat, it's like, how do you continue to follow the schedule and enact the forms without quitting? And in longer retreats, it's really clear because we struggle with pain and doubt and confusion and sleepiness and irritations and longings and all these things that feel like they're closing down the free flow of energy. But actually what it's asking to relinquish is all our personal preferences in, in will in a certain way so that we surrender and feel the weight of love under the burden of solitude under the burden of dissatisfaction the weight we carry is love how will we carry it yes yes that's what i wanted i always wanted I always wanted to return to the body where I was born, uh, the place of continuing to choose life. So that's probably enough for our reflection. You remember the phrase that I often use is that um, our ordinary way of meeting life is to try to get get answers. Um, we have these questions, we want to get them answered. But what inquiry does is it questions our answers. In our practice, our answer is our life. That's how we're answering all the time. And then we question it. Is this wholesome? Is this free? Is this in accord with the life energy or against it? So we turn turn things around. And I, I wonder, um, I'm curious about how what I'm talking about now, both the little bit of poetry and these teachings, how they're landing. Uh, Claire Coatman, would you, would you mind stepping forward? Raise your hand and then Maria will help you. Thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. I'm just wondering what's um, moving in you as you listen to these things, if there's anything that you're aware of. Um, I, felt, I felt a bit not connected. I felt a bit... Mm -hmm distracted and tired and a bit sort of like um I don't know kind of like I I I don't know I kind of partly just despite the um we're all trying to practice with our preferences I think I partly show up to these things because I do it, I do feel connected often and um so the feeling of being kind of tired and disconnected kind of dull 
Mm. It is not as common for you or ordinary? Is that what you're saying? Um, I think it is quite common. Okay. But often coming coming to inquiry is the thing that oh, really shakes nice. things up yeah. a bit. And what's yeah. and what has happened that right right at the very beginning I call you forward? What's happening now? Um, I feel a lot more present and a lot more connected. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you long for? Um, to be seen. To be seen. And when I asked you that question, a little smile came. Is there some way in which that longing to be seen is beginning to open just a little bit in this little strange context that we have? Um, yeah, I think, I think I smiled because I've been kind of, it's been around a lot for me today, like being seen, not being seen. And it feels like being called forward in inquiry is a big being seen. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I got, kind of got what I was asking for today. <laughs> And one of the things that I'm deeply appreciating is how uh, honest you are about it. That you're saying exactly what you feel. Because that's the only way to be seen. Is to actually show up mm -hmm. to be seen. Not present a face, not act in a certain way, not try to be this kind of person or that kind of person. But to be yourself, which I can count on. I know you. Uh, but still, it's a big ask in this situation. Mm. feels really relieving to hear that though I get a real expansion in my chest hearing you say and hear, just being whatever you are oh be who you are mm. yeah I want to see and that's how to are. be seen yes yeah. uh -huh. my expectation isn't that you satisfy me in a certain way I mm. want to know who you are so we can meet mm. because then you can feel the full weight of love Oh, that's a bigger breath. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Claire. Is mm. there anything else you wanted to say or ask or anything before we shift? Um, no. Thank you for seeing me. I have one last question that's a very mundane seeing you. Did mm. you change your hair color? I did. I am, um, this is my natural hair. So I used to dye it blonde. And then during lockdown, it grew out so much. I kind of realized the color that I hated as a teenager. And I just hadn't seen in 13 years, actually I quite like as an adult. So you're actually letting yourself see yourself. Hmm. And let us see you who you really hmm. are. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. And Judith? <clears throat> there you go okay there it's un unmuted okay so your greatest uh, fear and your greatest longing now are realized i called on you right here right now <laughs> yes <laughs> this is it it's, um, what's here what's here mm. I have felt, um, and I'm feeling it right now, that I don't, that there's something I'm missing or something I'm not getting. Um, every time the pandemic is mentioned, you know, it's, I'm, it's supposed to be this really big awful thing and it just has not been for me mm -hmm. so i feel really it's like what's wrong with me what's wrong with me i i kept on working i 
have, I live where there are lots of people and we continued seeing each other outside and I just feel like, and I do not know personally anyone who died mm -hmm. from COVID. I know a few people who had it, but all of them recovered without continuing symptoms. So I kind of feel like this whole thing just passed me by, you know, I mean, <laughs> hallelujah, but... <laughs> Well, I said, we see the beauty and the horror. You're a, a well-educated woman who attends to media. So I know that you understand what's happening. You're not saying that you don't understand what's happening. Oh, no, no. But the person, how I'm not feeling it personally. And you have some expectation that you should? Yes. Yes, oh, I do. But that's not your embodied reality. It seems not. <laughs> then what could you transmute? Because it's easy for you to think there's something wrong with you. That's yes. actually part of the old habit. Exactly. So with the embodied reality that you're actually living in, what's a perspective you could set next to your automatic one, which is there must be something wrong with me. That's easy. What is your actual, when you described your life during pandemic, I'll, nudge you because we don't have to make it difficult. <laughs> what I heard is a, an immense potential for gratitude. Absolutely. I got to keep working. I got to have friends. I didn't get sick. No one close to me, you know, all this. Yes. So instead yes. of the habit pattern thing, there's something wrong with you. What if you just in the face of the horror that you know is out there, could you just open to gratitude? Yes, and thank you for calling on me. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd had a conversation about this privately, and, and I know that you had a terror in the beginning, and yet there was a longing, but I figured after this many weeks, it was time. <laughs> it was time. <laughs> and are you now grateful for that? Yes. Yes, sincerely. Yes, yes. You did the two yeses of the last part of the poem. This yes. is what I've always wanted, <laughs> to come back, to come back to my true body. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm, um, I want to check with Bridget. I think she's around. There she is. Hi, Flint. It's good to Hi. see you. Hi. And then I have, uh, <clears throat> what's, what's present for you right now as we're here and you're listening to these people and Well, I'm wanting, longing for a, a more immediate way to recognize when I am focusing on the, the frustration and the, and the suffering, because it, the idea of being able to just recognize the habit of that and to shift my focus mm -hmm. would, is, um, and I feel a little fluttery because I, <laughs> Um, just being called on. I'm grateful for that. Um, How do you know that you feel fluttery? Just, um, just in my heart a little, you know, sort of that fine line between um, a little fearful discomfort, but the exhilaration of being brought forward and being able to s just be present with all of you. Yeah. That edge of terror and excitement. <laughs> right. But my, yeah. my point is, when you return to your body, to the embodied immediacy, you get the signal that you're actually asking to have. You want the signal that lets you know that you're caught in a habit? Yes. And it happens by paying attention to your body. I've seen you in many groups and times we've been together, and you can feel your nervousness, your shakiness, your anxiety, uh, your longing, your, uh, you get flustered, um, you, you feel relieved, you feel happy. You know, you always give me data that says you know how to pay attention. But somehow you don't, you're not trusting it or not realizing really the bounty that you've been given. Well, I'm, I'm more just uncomfortable when I'm with 
you know, in, in somewhat new situations or even with my, my new daughter-in-law and, and my new grandchild, this feeling that, that will they pick, will the baby pick up on my anxiety? Uh, will I, I just, I don't, um, but maybe I should just realize, okay, I'm a little anxious and nervous because I haven't, um, this is my first time to be doing some of these things and it's been a long time since I've helped settle a baby, but it's- Okay, that, that's a, a real lived example of that, what I was talking about. When you are concerned about this new grandchild picking up on some anxiety that you know that you tend to carry, mm -hmm. that's, that's the longing for this child to be free of such anxiety. Right. It's the longing for you to offer the, the full impact of a loving grandmother rather than anxiety. All that is healthy and good. You can turn it into an anxiety that closes you down and push you back toward yourself. Or you can realize that it's actually a deep practice aspiration. Well, thanks for, for stepping forward with my request. And thanks for um, calling me there, forward and for helping me understand this and be seen with you all. Is there anything else you wanted to ask or say? Just gratitude for everyone present. Great. Thank you. And I'm going to ask one more person um, before we, we switch over to... Um, I think maybe John uh, Copeman might be available also. And I didn't think when I wrote my list that I was going to do this family thing, but it's just how it lined up for me. It wasn't intentional. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, Flint. Hello. Hello. It's wonderful to see you and to hear your voice. It's good to see you. Good to be here. Yeah. 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 How, how is it now that we're... You and I are here together speaking. What, what's it? Mm, um, noticing a part of me going, oh, 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 oh. And, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> I, know this isn't, I know this isn't your favorite thing. Um, Somehow it feels easier, actually, with you calling me forward than for uh, me stepping forward. Okay. Yeah. Good. And I feel I can somehow it, it's easier for me just to to meet you just, mm -hmm. just like this without having in inverted commas having to have a question to ask. Right. Mm -hmm. And I yes. So just sitting here, being here feels feels good. Yeah. And I, I, I'm resonating with the, what I'm receiving, what you're saying is the appreciation of what it feels like to be chosen. It doesn't have to be any grand way, just called forward. Yes. If there's somebody yes. to turn toward me, I would feel it, or you, and just say, yes. I, 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 want, I want to connect with you. Yes, indeed. And, but, and, and also, as well as that, uh, in, in this sort of setting where it's a, a formal, plus more or less formal, meeting with somebody else, that's what, that's sort of where I feel, feel at ease actually, and it's uh -huh. somehow, off, often, and it's coming forward with, coming forward with, with having, to, having to have something to say, something to ask. That's, that's what ties my brain up in knots. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, but the, just the gentle meeting. Yeah. Is, um, it's a place of comfort. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And in, in a way, it doesn't matter for me that there are lots of people here yeah. present too, yeah. Really doesn't. That's how I'm organized. That's how I'm yeah. constructed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, and thank you for. Um, I'm I'm noticing something I didn't anticipate, which it's not a surprise, but I, 
is moving in me really strongly, almost to the point of feeling a little uh, teary in a, in a way, is I'm just thinking of the number of years that you were always right there supporting me in the intensives, making mm. copies, receiving, communicating, mm. Mm. Was always my, one of my assistants, and without question saying yes, yes. Mm. And I feel such gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciated, I really appreciated doing that, be, being there and doing that. Yeah. Uh, may we have another opportunity. May, in, may we indeed. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and maybe if there are other people who wish to raise their hand, that would be, that would be welcomed. Uh, John. Okay. Next. Another John. Uh, uh, something good is happening with me. Um, and I could tell it, especially when we did chat about the rope. And that is, uh, I think it has to do with what we're talking about here, because a lot of the times when I'm talking, you know, as you could probably tell, I have a bass voice and I like to sing bass in the choir and so on. And, but a lot of times my voice will feel really constricted. Um, and this morning it's not, doesn't feel constricted and that feels really good. So it's, it's like for a long time, I felt that constriction as I uh, your body's a, telling you your body's telling you something that you, somehow something's relaxing yes and I don't know a whole lot more about that except <laughs> I don't know how much you want to know about my personal life but there's a lady I've met online and she is texting me back and forth that she liked to hear the sound of my voice and so I thought, well, gosh, I don't know. I feel self-conscious about the sound of my voice. Now I feel better about the sound of my voice, uh, just in that setting as well as, as others. But another thing that goes along with that is I've had a sleep issue and keep waking up and so on. And now the past couple of days, I've slept really soundly and really late. I'm like, gosh, what is wrong with me? And it may just be that I need sleep. Well, but, what you're telling us is that your embodied immediacy the feeling of relaxation, your ability to sleep is suggesting that you're opening beyond your old habits mm. and you're able to move a little more easily in life. That's what our practice is for. It will show up as this or that story. Mm. But you're able to relax into life a little more easily by these kind of practices that you're engaged in. Uh, that helps. Keep, keep that up. Mm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. We have Jan next. Yeah, you never know. Is it Jan or is it Duncan? <laughs> oh, yes. Me <laughs> <Yeah>, too. <laughs> <laughs> what are you bringing? Just me. Just wanted to meet. Hmm. So there's something. Um, what's the the um, embodied shape of the longing? What do you notice? A full heart. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think the poet was talking about when he said the weight of love? Hmm. I was really confused by that at first. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think then something's moved in to a recognition um, that it's the weight of the longing, it's the yearning. I don't know, and maybe, maybe. Um, the yearning of unfulfilled. The yearning for what? The yearning for love and maybe the weight is when it's unfulfilled. Well, that's one side of it, I think. I think that's right, because we can feel the, the, the burden of the longing. But, you know, in the, in the poem, 
It's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just checking back here. I see the word. And that it says, under the burden of solitude and the burden of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Those were the burdens. Mm -hmm. The weight we carry under the burdens is actually love. That's unusual, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If if you're in a place of need or longing, mm -hmm. and you turn to um, your lovely husband that's right there, or mm -hmm. someone else who cares about you, mm -hmm. and you know that he or whoever it is actually does see you and loves you, mm -hmm. can you feel that land in your body? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that weight of love is what's underneath the burdens of dissatisfaction and isolation. Suddenly, the, the burdens of dissatisfaction and isolation are relieved, and you can feel, instead of that, you feel the weight of love, not the weight of those burdens. Ah, not the weight as in a problem. The mm -hmm. impact, the touch, the feel. The, you know, you want some... You know what it's like to, to, when you lie on someone or someone lies on you or you have a baby um, lying in your chest or the dog sits in your lap? You feel yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think, um, yeah, I think I got a bit caught in in weight being a negative thing, being an unhelpful thing. Right, but I think, right. You know, um, I don't and know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking now of like a weighted blanket and, and the soothing and the nurturing, mm -hmm. the weighted blanket. Mm -hmm. Or as you say, like the weight of the cat on the knee or the feel mm -hmm. of Duncan when we're you know, close. Yeah. So just let yourself be mindful and mm -hmm. notice what happens as Duncan just puts his arm around you and pulls you closer. Go on then. There are over 50 people right now feeling a shift in their own body <laughs> as they watch you. <laughs> because we can feel that, oh, that's what we're talking yeah, about. Mm. Yes, it's not a burden. Mm. But isolation and dissatisfaction, those burdens have been lifted. Mm. And now you feel the weight of love. Mm. And that's the yes, yes. Mm. Yes, this is what I wanted, what I always wanted, to return to the body where I was born, to return to this body, to our natural state. So those hands that are clasped in front, each of you, mm -hmm. can you make this with one of each one of your hands? There you go. Now you can bow together. <laughs> as one <laughs> thank you jan thank you thank you duncan thank you there you go oh, hi flint uh, you could um, feel that one in your body couldn't you oh my goodness yes the two of them jan and duncan you know i it brought tears to me just that how you moved them or together and the mm. weight and our, you know, our our mirror neurons in our body, we will, that's, we can feel that desire for that, can't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in my practice, this poem hit um, <clears throat> a note from my practice yesterday and today, um, because um, in my breath, I use uh, the ocean for the mm -hmm. ocean, the waves going out and then coming back. And I've, I've gone from the, the ocean, <clears throat> sorry, to a a little kettle pond. I, I sort of narrowed it smaller. And this kettle pond in Cape Cod is a family place. There's always lots of little kids. And so in my practice, sometimes in watching my breath, I'm watching like a little child. It's usually my little brother. And yesterday, it was me as a baby. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was like little Rosemary. And yeah. today, she was there, but I was the mother. Mm -hmm. So it was returning, like returning to the body. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, that was love. And, you know, sort of an opportunity to do it over and support her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. Sounds because she's it's she's it. you know yeah where, where is that little pond um it's in east ham mm -hmm. um in cape cod <laughs> close to where um, the institute is wonder, yeah. if we go back maybe you have to show it to me oh i'd love to yeah it's a sweet sweet spot mm -hmm. yeah and that and so. you found the sweet spot today i did i did and thank you so much for the poem it just you know, yeah, you know. I think someone put the full poem in the chat or at least a link to it. Th those are just the little bits of it. Yes. So you can take a I look at it. That. So yeah. thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. <clears throat> we have just a few more moments. Um, so we can enjoy our um, our final chant of the four practice principles because they describe what it's like to maintain wonder in the face of uncertainty really and it's because when we're caught in our the the self-centeredness things become small and wonder dims as we hold to the constructs and the organizations that keep us smaller the dimming, but what happens if we turn toward life as it is, then it illuminates and refreshes, like opening the window. Fresh air comes in, and light can come in. And so we can move then with a way of compassion, with a way of care, with a way of mindful, embodied, and diligent care. <clears throat> so let's use the four practice principles now. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way, caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream, each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. I, I will remind everyone that um, these um, sessions are recorded and they're available uh, later. You can find them through the Appamata website <clears throat> and the, the YouTube channel. So you can listen to them again if you want, or those of you that may uh, come on late if you're interested in reviewing what you might have missed, uh, they're available. And your support that you offer us helps us continue to be able to make these these things available in our time. And Maria? As Flint was just saying, Appamada's programs and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. There is a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move on to the next part of our evening where we all meet on the porch um, for a further 30 minutes to meet and share. And you're all invited, you're all very welcome. And if you'd like to take a two minute break to freshen up and stretch your legs, please do and meet us right back here in this room. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>